The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Kristen Schloss from Razorly. Welcome to our Manufacturing Suite webinar series. We're excited to have you join us today for our next webinar in the series, How to Communicate Smarter with the New Productivity Pack. I'm pleased to introduce to you our speakers for today. First, Rodney Coffey is our Practice Manager for ARIS, and he will be introducing the Productivity Pack. Also joining us is Derek Needing, our Engagement Director, who will take us through a live demo. But before we start, just a few housekeeping notes. First, this webinar will be recorded and we'll be sharing this recording with all registrants. Also during this webinar, we value your opinions and encourage any questions. To ask a question, please enter them into the panel at any time. We will have a Q&A session at the conclusion of this presentation. So now I'm gonna hand you over to Rodney. Very good, thanks, Kristen. So good morning, good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're at. <clears throat> um, yeah, as Kristen said, we're here today to give the webinar on the brand new productivity pack. So we're gonna talk about how to communicate smarter with that productivity pack. Um, before we get started, I wanna remind everyone, this is really, you know, it's it's been some time, but this is an extension of the demo series we did related to the complete manufacturing suite. So the productivity pack is a part of that suite. Um, if we take a look at our <clears throat> manufacturing suite diagram, um, just to give everyone a refresher, uh, last year we did uh, webinars around the change management, supplier management, and training management module. Um, some of the other items you see here on the left, we should have upcoming webinars as those are in the product roadmap for manufacturing suite. Um, and we're really excited about this productivity pack. So I want to talk just a minute about, uh, again, what the goal of the manufacturing suite is and why the productivity pack is different. Um, if we could go back for just one moment. Back one slide. So the um, the purpose of the manufacturing suite around Aris Innovator is really twofold. Um, one, to extend the capabilities of existing business applications. Uh, change management is an example of that. Uh, we're taking the um, close to out of the box change management process and then adding our own flavor to that to add things like prototype to production management as well as some other features and functionality. And then also to build business applications that fill a gap based on our customer demands. So things like training management. Um, so for, you know, we get a lot of requests for certain things that don't exist on the platform. We've built custom solutions and packaging those into the modules that build up the suite are uh, important. So one of the things I love about the productivity pack is this is our um, first module that isn't necessarily just business application focused, but more about how to use Aris Innovator platform um, better in general. So the features and functionality that we'll see in Productivity Pack are really going to give you um, overall end user and admin capability on the platform, not just into a niche business application area like change or supplier. So we're gonna hang out on this side for just a moment. Um, if we take a look at what the different pieces of the Productivity Pack are, um, you'll see that it's really, again, twofold. Um, if you take the bottom left three uh, nodes here in our circle diagram, package admin utility, Microsoft Visual Studio integration, and the user membership enhancement, um, these things are really administrative focused. So these are tools that no matter how many business applications you have um, on Aris Innovator or what your adoption cycles look like, these are things that are going to help your admins um, do better development, more efficient management of the custom AML, custom code that you've developed, and then better um, ability to uh, port your packages from development to test to production. So um, I'm really excited about these things. These are things where, you know, we say drink your own Kool-Aid. These things to the bottom left are all things that our team is actually using on a regular basis in our consulting engagements. And now we're able to package these up and bring that uh, value to our clients. The top three right modules, out of office delegation, Microsoft Teams integration, and workflow and assignment management, um, were again, things, features, similar to the things we've done in other modules, um, but again, affect the whole platform. So not just for change, not just for supplier, you can use out of office delegation, no matter what modules you have. Uh, Microsoft Teams integration, while it's closely related to the project management um, workflow in 
and Eris, that's how we're kind of seeing our customers look at that, um, it could be used abroad just to enhance the communication cycle as everyone adopts Microsoft Teams. I think, I know we've adopted it and the majority of our customers have adopted it at this point. And then just general workflow and assignment management. So anywhere you have a workflow under any of the business applications in Eris, um, this will come into play. So again, not, not business application features like change supplier or training where um, these things can be used all across your Eris Innovator environment. So um, if we take a look at these things specifically, uh, Derek's gonna do you know, a great job going through the technical demonstration. Him and I have been through this with a few early adopters and some other clients. Um, but these are some of the key advantages, key features and functionality um, that you will be taking away from that. So I know we've got a, a lot of, uh, um, a lot of value that we're gonna see in the technical demonstration. And there is a lot of content to get through uh, in particular with the productivity pack. So I'm gonna pass it off to Derek and we're gonna get right into it. And then we'll try to leave some time for questions at the end. Great, thanks Rodney. Let me um, switch over to my screen so we can watch the demo here. So we're gonna kind of do the demo like Rodney described it, showing just kind of the different modules. We'll stick with kind of the user management modules. We'll look at some of the workflow related modules. We'll look at some of the development and administration modules. We'll kind of do it in that order. We're gonna um, start with one of the user management modules and that's out of office delegation. I think the use case for out of office delegation is really pretty straightforward. Um, there's workflow processes that happen, and when those happen, if I have an assignment, but I'm going to be out of the office for a period of time, I need to have a delegate that can go and act on my behalf. And so that's what out-of-office delegation is. So let me show you how we set that up. And while I do that, I'm going to also introduce you to just a little user management tool that we added, and that's this open identity record. So, um, you know, we find that, that sometimes users, as they manage this sort of thing, like this out-of-office delegation, and a couple other things that I'll point to in a second, they need to get to their identity record. And that's kind of buried and maybe not super easy to get to. So we just put a little shortcut up there where we can get to the identity record pretty quickly. Um, and so when I'm here, you notice that I can see that I've got some delegation uh, assigned. So in this case, uh, for the remainder of this week, I will be out. And so I've got a colleague that can act on my behalf. And so to add out of office delegation, it's really pretty simple. We created a, um, uh, a shortcut uh, called add surrogate user. And we just simply go through and we select the user that we might want to add. So in this case, I'll pick, for example, um, Steven. We'll say that he, I'm gonna be out of the office uh, this week. So by the way, you'll notice I already have an out of office uh, person assigned an out of office surrogate. You can't have multiple. And then those multiple would be able to act on your behalf. And there's another interesting thing about that is if I try to go through and add Steven, the system is smart enough to know um, if Steven is planning on being in the office. And in this case, he actually already has an out of office delegation set up. So it's not gonna allow me to assign him. That wouldn't be very helpful to assign someone as my surrogate who themselves is gonna be out of the office. So uh, you can see how we do that. We just simply add a new surrogate user, pick a user that doesn't have, that, or that does have availability, and we can add that user. In this case, we've already got Tim set up, so we'll, uh, we'll leave Tim there for right now. Another thing I'll point out that is a, you know, kind of an admin or user management enhancement that we've added is this, um, these fields on the identity card that show us members of, and mem members of identities and members of teams and the role on that team. So again, there's cases where you, you really need to know uh, what team you're on, what identity, what group you're a member of, maybe there's a permissions thing that isn't happening the way you expected it to uh, there's assignments that you're not getting and so you just don't know what what group you're in and what team you're on and again that information is all in eris it can be a little bit varied sometimes and so we've put these two controls on this form to give us the ability to see that a little bit quicker so let me just kind of show you how that works if i go over as an admin and i look up some identities so let's um Let's search for an identity, and we will search for uh, ch uh, the change specialist, I think. So pull this up, and if I search for change, we see that there is a change specialist uh, identity. And if I wanted to go in, for example, and uh, take and edit this and add a member to that identity, 
and we'll add myself to that. And we'll call that done. So now I would, of course, receive additional permissions and behaviors and those sort of things because of that identity that I'm now a member of. So if I were to go back and open my identity record, we would notice that it's very easy. Oh, let me close this window down. We'd notice that it's very easy for me to see that I now have membership in additional places. And so again, just kind of a quick way to get to something that we find is very common. Uh, as Rodney mentioned, this is something that we tend to add as we're doing consulting engagements with customers because it's just needed. It's the sort of thing that you need as you go through and you roll out the solutions and set things up. And so it's just kind of a nice way to be able to get to, to different things. Same thing over here, you know, this shows me the teams I'm a member of as well as the role that I'm participating in within that team. So similar to identities, but just a different way to look at that. I am gonna go through, by the way, and just remove this out of here just for fear that it uh, doesn't change something in a workflow. I haven't vetted all the workflows completely to know that it wouldn't cause a problem. So we're gonna move that out of there. All right, so let's talk, uh, let's get into workflow and talk a little bit about um, some of those things. But before I do, there's actually one other thing I wanna to touch on that wasn't uh, shown in Rodney's slide uh, show. I don't know if we just missed it or maybe it's gonna be a surprise to Rodney, but it's another feature that we have within, uh, that's kind of an administrative feature. And it's this feature called required item type. So we've created a new item type uh, inside of uh, uh, Innovator called uh, required item type properties. And so here's the scenario. You've got a, uh, an item type and you've got a property on that item type and you want that property only to be required in certain situations. For example, the situation might be that if the part is of classification component, then the description is required, but if it's of classification assembly, then the description is not required. And so to do that, normally you would have to write some code to do that. And if that logic changed over time, or if you wanted to apply that same logic to multiple item types, you'd have to go in and kind of reapply that code. Well, we've added the ability to do that just through this very simple administrative portal. So I can simply create a new uh, object here, say that it's for the part item type and it's the component classification. And then I can go down here and start to set the description field is required on save. Effectivity date, is required on workflow. We'll get to that in a second. Let's focus on this uh, description field for a second. So what that means is what happens is if I go in now and let's go into creating of a new part and we create a new part and we'll call this part uh, PRT-115. And I'm gonna leave the, the, uh, the, the uh, long description off and we will set it as a component. And let me set that to test. And we hit save. And so because it's a component and because of that setting that we were just looking at, the, uh, the, the enhancement that Razorleaf offered, we now have that this field is now required. So the description field is required, but it's not a required field. If you went into the item type definition and looked at that property, it would not be set as required. Instead, it's just required in this one scenario. So if I go in and say, well, instead I wanna make this an assembly, well, then all of a sudden the description is no longer required. Change it back to a component. And if I do that and try to save it, then once again, it's gonna run through that logic and determine that that field is required. And it will greet me with a message box that says that that's something that I can't do because of that. So it's a very easy thing to set up. It's a very easy thing to turn on and off. I can come in here and simply um, uncheck that and it's no longer required. So again, the code is already written for you. We've written the code, wrap this interface around it so you can make these, change very, these changes and enhancements very quickly and uh, very easily. So we'll discard that change and we'll close this out. So that's kind of a neat little thing. This required on effectivity, just kind of make a mental note of that. We're gonna come back to that in a second, but basically what we're saying here is that um, the uh, uh, effectivity date is gonna be required at some point in the workflow. So at some, when we get to some point in the workflow, the effectivity date on any part that is of the component classification, it's gonna be required within the workflow. All right, so let me see here. Let me just, uh, I am gonna go ahead and create a new part that we're gonna use in a workflow in just one second here. So let's create one. We'll call it test part, and we'll go ahead and give it a description since it's gonna bark at me if I do not. We'll make it a component. 
and we'll add this thing because we're going to need this part within a workflow in just a moment anyway. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some workflow assignment and some workflow capabilities that we have uh, as part of the productivity pack. And um, so the first assign, the first uh, enhancement, well, let's do a couple things to make this a little more visible. I'm gonna go through and open up the workflow map. And these ones uh, happen to be associated with the ECO workflow, the Express ECO. So we'll look at that workflow map. And um, in order to explain it a little bit better, let me actually create an ECO workflow so we can look at the screen of the ECO workflow. So the first thing we're gonna look at is some dynamic user assignment. So if we look at the Express ECO workflow map, we've got a node here called planning. And if you look at the assignments of that planning node, they are blank. So who should fill the role of that planning node? Well, we have created a tool that you can add to any node in your workflow, and it is called Assign from Property. So when this node gets activated, our code will run, and what that code will do is it will look at, there's an Assign from Property variable. It will look at that variable in the name of that variable planning voter, and whosoever name is in that field, planning voter, is going to be assigned to this particular activity. So we don't have to sign that person in advance, but instead, based on what we fill out on the form, that person will be assigned at runtime. We can assign an individual, we can assign, assign a team as well. Both of those will work with this functionality. Some additional functionality that we have available to us is the assign voter to activity. And if you look at the description of what that does, let me stretch this out a little bit. If you look at the description of what that does, it says it assigns a voter to an activity um, uh, based on the activity variable. So long uh, description of what that means is basically, I wanna take who's ever assigned to this activity and assign them to this activity also. So it's taking information from the workflow history, the, the assignees from the workflow history, and pushing them forward to nodes in the future. So if I look at the variables, you can see that the variable for that looks like this. Basically, it says, if I go down the start work path and end at the draft changes activity, so start work, draft changes, I wanna take whatever user was on this current node and move them to the draft changes assignment as well. And so again, dynamic user assignment. So it may be that, for example, um, you might wanna have the person that does change review be the same person that does plan review. So we don't know who's gonna be the, the reviewer at this point, maybe it's assigned with some other logic, but whoever it is needs to be the person who does this activity as well. So by using this customization, we have the ability to set that up. Uh, the last thing that I'll show on this note is that we've got a, a piece of customization in there as well, which Rodney touched on. You'll see that in action in a second, which is notifying individuals in Teams that they have an assignment. So you're familiar with getting an email that says you have an assignment. The email has a hyperlink in it that you can click on and go access your assignment. Uh, we're gonna do the same thing inside of Teams. All right, last piece of kind of behind the scenes stuff that we'll look at before we actually see one of these in action is on this draft changes activity. And we've got some interesting things going on there. Um, we've got the Teams notification as well. But here's the other thing that we have is that required, uh, uh, validate required properties. So remember we were looking at that a second ago where it dynamically enforced the description field. But remember we also had the dynamic enforcement of the effectivity date field. So on this activity, when you go to vote on this activity, it is going to look at all of the parts that are attached that are of classification component, and it's gonna ask me to put an effectivity date on those parts. So we can decide at what point in the workflow we wanna do that, and we can decide what fields we wanna make required at those points in the workflow. And again, all of this is done by simply assigning these already pre-built methods to these events. And then there's some variables sometimes that you have to set up in order to uh, configure the method, but there's no coding that you need to do to do that. So that's kind of the behind the scenes of what 
um, happens with the workflow, let's go off and actually create one and see the thing in action. So I'm going to create a new ECO. We will call it um, ECO-122. The reason for change is demo. And let's see, we need to go ahead and add a part to this. Let's just add the part that we created just a minute ago, which was 117, I believe. So we'll add that. Uh, the other thing that we'll want to do is we'll want to set the planning voter because that's going to use for the dynamic assignment. Let me change this real quick to release. And we're going to set the planning voter and I will use myself as the planning voter. And so we've got that all set. I think we are good. Let's go ahead and be done with this guy. So what should happen is this should, well, first of all, it's going to allow us to initiate and send this workflow off. And then the first user will get it who happens to be the planning voter. So let's do that. We're going to go to the sign offs tab and we will send this thing on its way. Let me just show you another enhancement that again, Ronnie didn't touch on, but it's just kind of a little thing that's neat. If I choose to cancel the change, um, we've added an enhancement that allows us to configure the system that you have to put a comment in. If someone's going to cancel, we want to know why they're canceling. And so they have to put a comment. So that's something that you can turn on or off if you wanted to do that. Let's submit this over to planning. And so what's going to now take who the user was that was filled out in that um, planning, uh, uh, planning voter field and assign them to the workflow. And then notice, by the way, whoops, it went away. Let me bring that up for you just a second. It went away for me. Notice in Teams, I just got a notification that says I've been assigned an activity, the planning activity for ECO 10, 20, 1027, uh, and there's the title of the ECO and so on. I've got my hyperlink I could click on and go in and do those activities. So if a user is sitting in Teams, which again, we find a lot of our customers are using Teams as their communication portal, then they would get that notification from uh, the, the Razor Leaf tool immediately, then they could go and act on that. So let's jump over to a screen that's logged in as that user. And if I take a look at my in basket, you'll see that there is my 1027 and uh, there's the activity I need to work on. But remember, at the beginning of the demo, we set up out of office delegation. So I'm supposed to actually be out of the office right now. And I have a colleague that is covering for me. And so um, in order to, to demo that, let's log in as that colleague and uh, see what happens when they um, log in. So we'll, in this case, I think I set Tim as my delegate. So if Tim logs in and he goes into his in-basket, you'll notice he has 1027 appearing in his in-basket as well. And if he opens that up, he can look at the sign-off and he notices that it, even though it's assigned to Derek, it's showing in Tim's in-basket because he has been authorized to approve on my behalf during this period of time. And of course, that out of office delegation, once you set it, um, you know, the start date and the end date, once that end date ends, well then, you know, it, it will no longer uh, provide the functionality that we're looking at right now. So Tim can go ahead and vote on that in my behalf. In this case, he's gonna go to start work and he'll hit complete. And when he does that, again, real quick, notice in the lower right-hand corner, you see that Teams notification popped up. So I got notification of that. But here's the other thing that's kind of neat. Notice that the assignment, even though it was assigned to Derek, Tim is the guy who completed it. Now, of course, it shows right back up in Tim's in or in Derek's in basket, which Tim being my delegate, he sees it as well. But this is kind of neat too. Notice even though Tim completed it, who's it get assigned to? Well, it gets assigned to Derek, not Tim. Even though Tim completed it, we want to make sure that the next assignment goes to the person who is defined in the workflow map. Because again, if this maybe came out on a Friday afternoon and then I'm back in the office on Monday, well, I don't want it to go to Tim. I want it to go back to the person who was originally assigned and then we'll worry about the out of office delegation kind of behind the scenes. So you can see that now it has went to Derek. I'm gonna log out and log back in as Derek and assume that we're back in the office. And so if I go into my in-basket, we can find that work item. And if we look at the sign-offs, we'll see the same thing we saw just a few moments ago. We're currently in the draft changes activity. If I vote and I say that that looks good and we'll submit it for review, I think that's the path I wanna go down. Let me just look at my 
notes real quick. Uh, submit to review. Yep, that looks good. And we'll go ahead and hit complete. And so when I complete this activity, another thing's going to happen. Remember what we talked about earlier about the effectivity date. So the effectivity date is required on that part 117. And because I haven't filled that in yet, well, then I can't complete this. So we're dynamically enforcing a field to be required but we're going a step further. Remember before we enforced it to be required based on the classification. Now we're forcing it to be required based on the classification and where it is in the workflow. So all of that comes into consideration in order to uh, control that. Here's the cool part. Look how easy it is to configure those sort of things. Let's say that, that was in, we wanted to make a change. That's not our business process anymore. We don't really want it set up like that. So the administrator doesn't have to go in and write a bunch of code or make changes you know, heavy uh, changes to anything. Instead, he simply comes in here and he says that is no longer required on workflow. He'll save that, be done. And if now, if I go back to here and hit complete, voila, it's done. So not that now that's no longer in force. So that quick, we change the field from being required at some particular state and time when some conditions were met to not being required anymore. And it's that simple to be able to do that. And again, you can do that with any field, any classification, and at any point in its life cycle uh, along the workflow. Uh, so that's, that's pretty exciting stuff, the ability to, to set those items up and to configure that that way. I've got about 10 or 15 more minutes. We wanna jump out of some of the user and administrative things into a few of the development related things. So this is really exciting for, for us at Razorleaf because you know as we do implementations for our customers, um, there are, um, shortcuts and best practices and certain things that we come up with as we write lots of code and do development for them that we internally adopt because it just makes our job easier, more consistent, higher quality, those sort of things. And as we do that, sometimes we find that these are things that we believe our customers would use as well. And in this portion of Productivity Pack is exactly that. Our developers have been using this functionality for years. They, in fact, will not operate without this functionality that I'm going to show you. And we find it so valuable that we want to share it with the community as well. So to start with, let's just kind of set a, um, whoops, I did not want to do that. Let's just kind of set the stage here. I'm going to go in and look for a method called hello. Every, um, every environment has to have like a hello world. And so we've got a hello world out there. And so, you know, how, how does the typical Eris programmer go through and do programming. Well, they, they could use Notepad++ and maybe some add-ins that do some color coding and indenting. Uh, they could type it in here. This is not a great interface to be doing development in. Um, and so this is what our developers found. And so where do our developers want to work when they do coding? Well, they want to work in Visual Studio. Visual Studio has syntax checking. It's got IntelliSense, you know, you hit the little dot and then, then the options pop up. It's got the ability to kind of organize things in different ways. Um, it's got the ability to go through and put breakpoints in and do debugging. So our developers want to work in here, but meanwhile, the interface that's provided out of the box is this. So what we've created is an integration between Visual Studio and Eris Innovator to allow that to happen. And so this integration includes a couple different things. And so we'll start by showing you that the first thing I can do is I can create a new um, project and we have a project type. We have a template called uh, Eris. Um, and so that template, let me just look up here. There we go. So we've got a template for Eris projects. And when you open that template, When we open that, what happens, if you notice in the right-hand side over here, we create a new project, but we do a couple things with that project. Our developers like to organize their projects in a certain way. They put all their methods for the client side, the JavaScript in one folder, server side in another folder. They like to add all of the ARIS references. So we've got all the references already added. All of the, um, uh, the, the, the folders are created for organization purposes. And now I can start working very quickly and very consistently. The other thing we did is we've added a config file. And that config file has a couple different settings in it. It has server and development server settings. 
So these are the settings that allow me to connect to the ARIS database in order to put stuff in the system, put new methods in the system, and get methods out of the system. So I can go back and forth to ARIS. I set this configuration up and I can use two different servers if I want. I can have a dev server and a production server. And I can go through and grab stuff off of the server, put stuff back in the server, lock, unlock methods, and those sort of things right here from inside of um, Visual Studio. So I don't ever have to operate in this interface here ever again. This interface is there if I wanna come and look at it, but I'm gonna live inside of the real development environment, which is Visual Studio. So let me show you some of that in action. So um, the first thing is we've got a method here called hello world and the hello world method has a spot here, which we'll get to in a second, which is uh, debugging. Um, let's just make a change. Don't worry about what the line of code says right now. We'll come to that in a second, but let's just make a change. So I wanna make a change to that method. And if I go into the tools and I'm sorry, extensions, ARIS, I have the ability to lock the method on the server. So I'm gonna um, you know, check it out so that I can start working on that method. I have the ability to, once it's locked, I can go through and save it to the server. And then if I choose to, I can go through and unlock that method on the server. All right, let's jump back to the server real quick and look at something. So if I re-pull up, First of all, notice that this is at uh, version 13. Let's rerun that search. It just jumped up to version 14 because of those changes I made. And if I go into that method and take a look at it, you'll notice that the debugging line of code is now commented out because I just did that change. And so we have the ability to, to make our changes in Visual Studio and get them up to Eris without ever having to go into Eris and do any work inside of there. But I am gonna make a change here just to show you something else. Imagine one of my colleagues came in and made a change to this code, whether he did it in Visual Studio or whether he did it in here, the point of the matter is I now have out of date code because I'm operating on code that's on my machine. Well, we've added an extension for that as well, which is refresh methods from server. And if I do that, notice I get the latest code from the server and it brings it down for me and shows me those changes that are in there. So that's pretty exciting, the ability to stay in Visual Studio and do your development. This line of code is real important too, because this comes with when you when you create, if you use our add-in to add a new server method, for example, um, if we add a new item and we add a uh, new Eris Innovator server method, when I do that, this new server method comes in automatically. It's got some commenting in place, and then it goes through, and it actually already has this debug code in here. Now, what's the importance of this? Well, how do you debug um, Visual Studio code that's running inside of Eris? It, it can be kind of complicated. It, Visual Studio does have a, a, a debugger that you can attach to the IIS worker process and it can get kind of complicated. But the way that we've got it set up is essentially we have a line of code and if that line of code is uncommented, debugging is turned on. So anytime that line of code is uncommented, Debugging is turned on. What's that mean? Let's see it in action. Go over into Eris. I've got a action called hello world. Don't get hung up on the action. It can be anything. It could be a workflow event, uh, a server event, a button click, a menu click, anything that fires a server method. If you have the debug code turned on, debugging will happen. So when I fire that off, because debugging is turned on, Visual Studio is gonna interrupt and ask me if I wanna to attach to that worker process and if I want to begin debugging. And so when I say that I do wanna do that, it will bring up the Visual Studio window in context with my code loaded and with the code broken on the place where I said to stop. So now I can go through and use my F10 key you know, to step through the code. I can drag my cursor around if I want. I can throw breakpoints in. I can go down to the immediate window and start putting question mark this and that in order to figure out uh, what exactly is going on in my code. So now I can debug my code in real time versus trying to debug it through some text editor, which, you know, the way people usually do that is they throw in message boxes. The message box one, and then a couple lines later, message box two couple lines later, message box three. And then when they run their code, they just kind of keep track of what message boxes they saw and which ones they didn't. And that tells them where their code's broken. Well, in this case, we can run through and actually watch the code in action in the Visual Studio debugger. And so of course, now when I do that, 
my hello world method pops up and uh, and it's it's back to working. Let's make a quick change to that. So I'm going to close the debugger out and I'm going to go back to my original code. And we don't need to save any of that. We'll go back to my code that I had just a second ago and let's turn debugging off. So we'll turn it off and we'll go up here. We'll lock the method on the server. We'll go up here. We will save the method to the server and then we will unlock the method on the server. Now, if I go back into Eris and I refire that same action, it fires now with no debugging uh, interruption because the debugging is now turned off. So now this is how it would run when normal users were working with the system because debugging is now turned off. So I think that's a pretty powerful thing. If you do much development in Eris and you don't have any sort of connection between Visual Studio and Eris, your, de your development tasks can be very cumbersome. Not having IntelliSense, not having uh, real-time debugging, uh, all of those things make, can make it difficult to do programming uh, inside of Eris. So we think that this is something that's really pretty powerful. So the next thing that happens now that I've got the ability to easily write some code is I need to start packaging up that code in order to put it in packages uh, to send out as a customization. So we know that, that Eris has the ability to define a package and um, we haven't changed anything about that. But here's the question, what goes in the package? And so again, this is something our developers told us. How do they know when they've spent you know, the, the week, um, maybe it's taken them a month to write a piece of customization and they're all done, how do they remember all of the stuff that needs to be put in that package? What attributes did they add? What uh, sequences were created? Everything that was done, how do they remember all that? And so what they do is they fire up a notepad file and they just keep notes as they're going. And then at the end, they've got a list of everything that needs to be put in that package. Well, you know, maybe they forgot to put something in their notes. Um, but regardless, that's not a real efficient way to do it. So we've added something that allows us to go through. And if I, for example, say that I want to find everything that was modified by the innovator admin today. So we've added this new tool, package elements, and I can go in and see everything that this user modified today. Um, and well, let me let me change that to yesterday. There we go. There we go. Um, so I can see everything that this user modified in a particular period of time. And we can see that, you know, an identity was modified, an item type was modified. All that information is being reported back to me. So let's, for example, imagine that hello world tool that we just wrote. Let's imagine it needed a sequence also. So it's not hello world. It's something else that needs a sequence. So here I am, Mr. Developer, and I go through and I say, well, I need to create a new sequence because my tool that I'm writing needs a sequence. So I go off and I create a new sequence and I call it um, RL Hello World 1. And we'll make it uh, RL, we'll make it uh, a pad with zeros, pad to six, and we'll step by one. All right. So we now have a new sequence out there. And I go in my code and I do whatever I need to do inside of my code to utilize that sequence and everything's working and I test it and it's beautiful. And now here we are a month later, I'm done with my code and I'm ready to, to send this thing on its way. How do I remember that that little sequence that took me less than 30 seconds to create, that that's something that I need to package up? What if I forget it? And I deploy my package on another environment and it's running and it fails because the sequence was missing. Um, so what we can do is I can have in the system the ability to go in and say, let me find everything that was changed by this user on this date. And look at that, a sequence was changed. So I changed the a method and I changed the sequence. And if I went through and made a uh, field require a property required on an item type, that would show up in here. If I went through and made uh, changes to a user, that would show up in here. And I would see all that information. I actually get to see also if the, the piece of uh, Eris that I modified is already in a package or if it's not in a package. So if it's not in a package, then I can go through and, whoops, um, I can go through and choose to add it to a package and I can start to create my package. So when it's all said and done, everything that shows up in my list should be in a package.
that I can then go ahead and send out. So again, hugely powerful for our development team as they go through and make these customizations for our customers. Uh, if it takes them just a couple seconds, well then it's usually not that difficult, but when these things stretch into a couple days or even longer, trying to remember everything that, uh, that they worked with can be challenging. So I'm done with my demo portion. Let me just do a quick summary of the things that we saw just to, to refresh everybody's memory. Uh, number one, we looked at the out of office delegation. Along with that, remember we looked at some of the user uh, identity card enhancements, those two controls that we added that allow you to see the um, members, the membership that that user has. Uh, we also looked at some of the workflow assignment, the dynamic assignment based on a field on the form, the assignment based on who completed a previous task, we looked at the enforcement of uh, uh, required field based on the component type or based on where it was in the workflow. And then finally, we looked at some of our development tasks around the Visual Studio integration and also the package uh, wizard, uh, the package elements enhancements that we added as well. So those are things that, again, our users, our, uh, users and, and consultants find extremely helpful, and we trust that you would find them helpful as well. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Rodney. I think you're muted, Rodney. There you go. Yep. Very good. Thanks, Derek. Yeah. So I think what we want to do at this point is open it up for questions before a quick uh, before a quick recap. So I know uh, Kristen is still on the line. Um, we can find new people, or we can use the chat pod to take questions. Great, thank you, Derek and Rodney. Um, we'll go ahead and start the Q&A session. Uh, just a reminder to everyone, all questions, please enter them into the question panel. Uh, we do have a few questions here. Uh, one, which was earlier in Derek's um, presentation or demo, I should say, it said, uh, could this be something Eris adopts as part of an out-of-the-box subscription feature? Right now, I'll let you take that one. Um, could you reiterate that, Kristen? Can you say that one more time? Sure. Uh, could this be something Eris adopts as part of an out-of-the-box subscription feature? Uh, that's a good question. <clears throat> um, I can't speak for Eris. I do know that we, our product development group, as well as uh, myself and some of our other Eris practice leaders, uh, we visit with Eris every year annually to go over what our product roadmap is and the things we're going to do. So they have seen all these things. Um, they're aware of what we're developing, and we do that so that we're not developing uh, feature overlap. So we're not focused on things that they would then develop. Um, but so I can't speak for whether they would, you know, take our stuff and adopt it into the product core. Um, but I know that uh, for the things that you saw today, these are things that are not in their roadmap. Great. Thanks, Rodney. Um, a next question. Uh, can you integrate with other communication platforms other than Teams? You can, yeah, that's, we, we've kind of created the infrastructure. Um, so there's kind of two components to the Teams integration. There's the infrastructure that sends the message out. And then there is also a Teams piece that we wrote that receives that message. Um, so that infrastructure works with other communication platforms as well. Uh, you, know, you would have to write, or we would have to write the, the thing that replaced the team side of it. But uh, the majority of the infrastructure is there. It can be done very quickly. Okay, great, Derek. Do um, we have a specific, is there a specific example for that one, Kristen? No, there was what not. What platform they were looking at? Okay. So yeah, I, I'd like to add to comment on that. We um, we are looking at a few different Teams examples with a few clients to expand that Teams integration, and then we have had some requests. Obviously, SharePoint is part of Teams. Uh, we've had a long-standing SharePoint integration using the Clover Integrated Platform, so. We are looking to sort of merge those things uh, just because Teams does that naturally as well. Um, and then of course we, you know, we have integrated for other business system integrations to CRM, ERP, or other communication platforms too. So if you're looking for something similar to say Jira or some other type of project collaboration tool, uh, there are other things there to talk about as well. Perfect. Thank you, Rodney and Derek. All right, another question. Can you enforce required fields on custom fields or just out of the box fields? 
Yeah, it, it doesn't matter, both, both. So so we don't, we don't um, you just simply have to supply the field name. So, you know, whatever the internal field name is, um, long underscore description or whatever it may be, you just simply supply that and we enforce that uh, based on the field name. So either one works. Great. And then as a general, as a general comment on that question, everything you saw today, like like I said, the the manufact the productivity packs goal was to add an overarching layer to everything we've done on all the business apps. If you have custom business applications or any of that, all that customization, these things will work with. Thank you, Rodney. Uh, another question: How do you configure? Who can add or edit the required item type details? Yeah, that's a good question. It's an administrative function, but the way that we deployed that is by simply using a standard, uh, we created our own innovator item type. And so just like with any other item type and innovator, if you wanted to prevent people from seeing it, editing it, adding it, you just go into the permissions and you set up who's allowed to edit, add, view, uh, the same would be true with our item type. We call it required item type property. And the same would be true. You just set up who's allowed to edit that. So, um, you know, it wouldn't even necessarily have to be someone that's a super admin. It could be someone more like a BA level, for example, a business analyst level, someone that's involved in, you know, processes. So they want the ability to go and set what's required and what's not required. Um, you just simply use the innovator tools to set who's allowed to add, edit, delete that particular uh, object. Great, thanks, Derek. Um, got the last question here is, um, how is this priced? Yeah, so we handle, um, you know, we've addressed this in each one of these sessions near the end. Um, we have a manufacturing suite price overall, which would include, um, you know, obviously as part of what we're doing, it's subscription-based, exactly as Eris is. That includes your uh, software support, um, as well as, you know, so if we think about support, break fix, uh, support over upgrade, questions, answers, we've even done a little bit of, um, you know, ad hoc type training as we go through services to set this up. Um, but <clears throat> we have a complete manufacturing suite price, which includes all the modules. So, you know, Kristen right now has the previous suite webinars up here. That would be training supplier change and productivity pack modules all included in that so we have one price for that or we have per module pricing as well so if a customer is just interested in productivity pack uh, we can sell just productivity pack as well so there's bundled manufacturing suite pricing as well as individual module pricing great rodney thank you well, this concludes our Q&A session. So I'm gonna turn it back to you, Rodney, for any final comments. Um, yeah, I, if you could go back one slide there for me. We're all, uh, yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, I just wanted to remind everybody that uh, today's recording, uh, today's session for the Productivity Pack will be recorded. Uh, we've got, a pretty good website our marketing group has stood up that actually will give you a pretty quick link to all the webinars that we've done underneath the, the manufacturing suite. So if you are interested in going back and looking at the overview we did of the suite or any of the individual modules, all those videos that Derek and I have done are, um, are up there hosted. Uh, we're sharing those with a lot of new clients if you wanna go back and revisit a particular part. And then if you have any questions, um, I know we have a, a published price list for this. So if there are people that are interested and you're interested in what the pricing is, I can you know, email me. I can submit that out to you guys. Um, and then, like I said, we have, you know, we're doing a lot of creative things with new early adopters. So we have a handful of clients right now that are um, looking or have purchased productivity pack. And then, of course, we have some manufacturing suite customers from last year that have already gotten the productivity pack that are working through it. So. Um, really interested in getting this in customers' hands. That way you guys can help us use it, test it, make it better, um, get that feedback into our portal. So as Kristen, you can go to the next slide. Um, as you know, you see on this slide, of course, you can contact me for uh, pricing sales or just general information about any of this. We can also do private demonstrations if you guys have other folks that you know, we need to show specific modules to. 
but we also have the ARIS community at razorleaf.com. Um, you know, we wouldn't be building these modules, um, getting ideas for things like the productivity pack if it wasn't for our client base uh, bringing these things to us. So as you guys have new ideas, new feature requests, things you would like to see us focus on, I can't encourage you enough to hit that ARIS community at razorleaf.com. That comes to Derek, myself, and our product manager, Tim Nose. Um, so that we can go out there and shape our roadmap and, you know, keep supplying good solutions to the community. So uh, that's it for me. Great. Thank you, Ronnie and Derek, for the presentation today. Also, I want to thank all the attendees for your time and participation. And I hope you have a great afternoon. Thank you.